Hey you geeks! So, I picked up Lux after my grim dark debacle last month, hoping Sando would deliver a fun, light-hearted YA adventure novel! <laughs> you serious? It broke my heart in all the right ways and left me in a quivering heap of emotions. And that was only chapter three. Since most people probably haven't read this book yet, I'll give a longer spoiler-free review before I dive in. Going in, I wasn't sure about Sanderson buddy writing a book. Would it still be the mind-blowing, earth-shattering, yet somehow heartwarming Sanderson I've come to love? The answer is mostly yes. I haven't read any of the other Reckoner stories, so I can't make my own comparisons. But I'd heard that the Reckoners were Amazon's The Boys for children. And that is what this book is. Back when I was in this book's target audience range, this would have been called a boys book. Now I don't know what to call these books. YA sci-fi with a male protagonist? Let me know what they're called in the comments down below. The opening scene is a poker game for candy. And there's something about the way the narrator says, Texas Reckoner, that makes me think... I'm a Texas Ranger. We've got post-apocalyptic cowboys who fight on a flying motorcycle. A flying motorcycle! So cool! Although it technically wasn't flying because, you know, physics. Obviously, this book can be enjoyed by all types of readers, though it helps if you have an interest in engineering. Sanderson usually avoids techno babble, but this book... Well, it's not babble, but it's quite technical. This R2 unit has a bad motivator, look! Frankly, if I ever hear the word node or action potential again, it will be too soon. One last thing about this book's pacing. It was originally conceived as three novellas, which were transformed into this book's parts one, two, and three, meaning each part ends with its own mini, but incredibly shocking, Sanderlanch. That is really all I can say without spoilers. So here is the breakdown of characters, world building, and plot. Jax. I do like characters whose names start with the letter J. Personal quirk. Jax is a great kid, book smart, but street stupid. He's also a jock, which is just not fair. His flaws, namely his ego and wanting to save the girl, are understandable. So it's believable when they get him and everyone else into trouble. His tinkering gives him the best weapon combo. Boomerang? His clockstopper's watch makes his sword a practical weapon in the age of guns. The whole returning to the origin to stabilize teleportation makes sense, since this means that the watch has done zero work, while busting it to stabilize also makes sense as it's just the extension of kicking machinery makes it work. A practical leap in logic. Paige. She has more characterizations than just the girl, but the story still gives her the short end of the stick. A fake-out death early on, only to return with loads of character development which occurred off-page. <laughs> After which, she's the female stormtrooper with a heart of gold. How? Why? There's an interesting story here, but Sando won't tell us. I feel like this is sequel bait, coupled with the twist ending that now the personification of tough goodness has a diamond inside of her. I hope this book gets a sequel and we'll learn more about her, which is fine, I guess. Wade. I don't care that he's described as a skinny, pale Texan. If he's a computer geek named Wade, there is only one. What up, Wade? Kim. 
Also, Sherbert is for punch and punch alone. Herschel Zeph. I would give them each their own section, but it sort of felt like they were originally written as one character. Zeph makes a comment about giving his wife guarantees, which was Herschel's problem. Later, Jax talks about how Zeph taught him to read people when back in the opening scene, he said he learned it from Herschel. Having them be two different characters makes more sense. That way, Zeph can go down in a blaze of glory as a mentor, while Herschel can be the old guy who avoids responsibility. That didn't fit Zeph at all. I'll admit that at first, I thought we'd never get a backstory on Herschel's leg, like it's a mystery box. Though I should have known that Sando would go for the most traumatic backstory and that he had 127 hours it off. That's a verb now. Also, as a bonus, we get a Steelheart origin story for the longtime Reckoner fans. Wing Flare. There is a lady old and wise. There's nothing like Sanderson to make a child's daydream into a nightmare. Her power isn't really flying. It's telekinesis without conventional limits. If you can levitate anything you put your mind to, then why not just fly around and make sadistic challenges? Do you want to play a game? If her weakness is people refusing to play her games, then why doesn't she just never ask them to play? It's a highly subjective weakness that's all I am saying, but it's YA and in her nature. Love struck. I ain't saying she a gold digger, but she ain't messing with no broke bro. Life force. This man just eats the scenery. He's so reliably unstable that he fulfills the most cheesy of villain tropes with complete sincerity. And that is what makes him terrifying. I create life! And I destroy. His and Languish's origin story make me think Sanderson or Dole have some grudge against Target. What did Target ever do to them? This will pay for my uh, wife's Target run. Is this a guy thing? Or a rednecks prefer Walmart? thing, or a simple red versus blue and target just happens to be red thing. Motivators. Most of the powers are intuitive. The authors do a great job of using simple powers in cool ways. The aforementioned flying motorcycle. The use of glimmer to accelerate things. Like sound. Fun fact, the sound alone from the space shuttle launching will kill you if you stand too close. Though how the opposite of a radar is a shrink ray, that's a bit of a stretch. No one motivator is powerful enough to solve the group's problems, leaving room for our characters to be clever. I do love how Scorch Notes give the characters a practically boundless arsenal like it's some video game. Epic powers. Another fun fact, Graviton, the epic who killed Paige's parents, is also the name of a real subatomic particle used in the proof for string theory. The powers themselves are a great exploration of the novel's theme, no achievement without cost. The first cause of power is, of course, the epic's weakness. Although the name weakness is somewhat intuitive, I'm not sure I would have known exactly how strong these were if I hadn't heard an explanation beforehand. My my if it was in print, Sando would just need to capitalize the W, and I get it. But this is exclusively in Audible? So maybe a sentence or two to clarify would have helped. I feel like this was explained in other Reckoner books. Life Force's powers were a great way to keep the violence PG-13. 
lining up innocents behind the stormtroopers to keep the body count down. Sando does this in his other works, but that is a little more complicated, though equally villainous. And in case anyone forgot about the real and grotesque cost of violence, there was always Paige to remind our heroes, because she is too good to be true. Plot Part 1 is mostly backstory on a quest to take down the flying enemy base, which, in a twist to our protagonist, is actually really nice. Almost paradise! We get plenty of fun mini-quests on the way. They split a city in two, remind me of Firefly, and stick in a terrible betrayal. Though, if you are familiar with the promotional material, you note that Brigand is not on any of it. So, he was clearly doomed from the start. Once he answered back retirement package, I knew he found his severance package. Pity it had to be so literal. Part 2 starts out as ye standard Mission Impossible, which Sanderson does really well, and it's quite fun. And then we get even more flying motorcycles. I do love flying motorcycles. Kaboom. And then it turns into a horror movie because why not? Part 3 I thought was going to be a literal avalanche the whole time, or at least free fall on the vomit comet. Then Life Force takes matters into his own hands. Though, for good measure, Cloudbreaker throws a hissy fit. Friends call me Snow Miser. Lux must have some military grade electronics because my phone battery freezes in the high 20s Fahrenheit which is a bit chilly. We never get a thermometer reading for the Frost of Lux, but I'm guessing it's supposed to be sub-zero temperatures, though this might just be an oversight. I figured out that Life Force's weakness was Silver from Languish's backstory. At first I thought, what? Is he a werewolf? Then I recalled... I owe Silver! Away! And we're back! to ye old west, in the post-apocalyptic sky, as paradise falls from heaven. Though I couldn't get the William Tell overture to play over the finale. And I tried. In the end, I wonder what it means that the star disappeared. Is Paige the new calamity? Death Rise sounds ominous, but what does it mean? My curiosity is peaked for future Reckoner reading, though I don't feel a big desire to go back and read the original Reckoners. Thank you for watching. Please like, share, and subscribe if you would like to see more. Your patronage is greatly appreciated.